right, so um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Giovanni Pruzzese. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Liechtenstein, the tiny little country at the heart of Europe. But the first thing I want to say is that I was not alone in writing this paper. I was supported by five other great scientists, spanning from both academia and industry. However, the list of contributors does not end here. I would like to fly all of you to Dutch Tool. Last year in July, this is where it all began. There was a research seminar on the security of machine learning. This is where most authors met. And this seminar started with a talk by Catherine Roche. She discussed about a recent research she conducted with real machine learning practitioners about how they handle security of their machine learning systems. The general consensus was why do so, which is a, a bit concerning given how many papers appear every day on this subject. And I think that this conference is here and exists because of this very reason. But anyway, a lot of discussion were held during this seminar about how to have a research to have a bigger impact to the real world. And we couldn't find any concrete quest, any concrete answer, but a recurring theme, something that uh, was mentioned quite often, especially by practitioners, was uh, the real attacker's guess. And this is interesting because uh, in research, it's rare to find papers that are entirely based on guessing. Sometimes the attacks, they tend to be complex, they tend to be exact, they tend to be very uh, algorithmical in some cases. This is also a term that was uh, mentioned very often. So one week later, after the seminar, I, had, uh, I was having a discussion on Zoom with uh, Fabio Pirazzi. And we decided that we wanted to investigate this, perhaps write a paper about this. We, we, know, we were aware that there was this conference at this first edition that they accepted position papers. So this was just the perfect place. We sent an email to three of the other authors, authors and decided, uh, asking if they want to con contribute to something. And we said, oh, you know, um, it, they accept position papers that are five pages long. And now our final version of the paper, of the paper was 26 pages in length. So we clearly did, we did not know what we were getting into at that time. So one month later, uh, we submitted a paper and uh, it was appreciated apparently. So what did we actually do in the paper? Now, the title was uh, deliberative provocative. Um, clearly, real attackers do not compute gradients. That's a pretty bold claim to make. But that's actually a starting point. Like, do real attackers actually compute gradients? We tried to answer this question by looking at the AI incident database. Uh, we, start, we use queries such as um, um, adversary examples, gradients, even evasion. We couldn't find any trace of a real attack that attacked a real system. So we decided to investigate this on our, on our own. And um, we reached out to a security company. They gave us some data about uh, their um, uh, machine learning system that they use. In this case, it's a phishing website detector powered by deep learning. And we wanted to investigate these samples. They gave us around 9,000 web pages. I mean, if attackers do compute gradients, perhaps we could find some trace of adversary examples among these pages, right? Now, what did we find? Um, the majority of these samples, they were out of distribution. These samples, by the way, they were all, all like poorly classified by this detector. And the reason for these misclassifications, most of them, they were due to being out of distribution. They were never seen, uh, or were, they were clearly different from any sample included in the training data. What about the remaining ones? They were all like that. Um, they use techniques such as blurring logos, introducing uh, mistakes, artifacts, all techniques that have been known since decades by fishers, but which are still effective today to thwart real production grade machine learning systems. And they're also cheap to stage because they do not require any kind of advanced computation. Now, this case study, we used it to support some of the observation that we make and that we then use to uh, try to bridge the gap between uh, research and practice of this domain. First is machine learning systems. The machine learning models, which all of you develop and experiment on, uh, all of us actually, because I also do the same thing. Um, well, they're just a single component of a much larger and complex system. Um, some, and it is these systems that real attackers have to face, have to interact with and have to bypass. In some cases, we also argue that there are some, some such a thing as invisible machine learning systems. We are not talking about the black box, like the, uh, the system which attackers do not know how they work. We are talking about systems that whose output may not even arrive to the attacker, or if, if, or if it arrives, it may arrive after a long feedback, after a long um, delay, or perhaps 
it may not even entail any machine learning computation in it because some inputs may not be processed by machine learning because they go into a different pipeline. And this complexity is rarely captured by research papers. And we do provide to like time to fix this, uh, this gap a case study. And we, pro pro um, we provide the schematic of the spam detection system used by Facebook. And this system has a four layered architecture. And uh, interestingly, the part that actually uh, solves the problem of detecting spam is at the lowest layer. At the top layer is um, our techniques, some of which also use machine learning, by the way, that uh, are meant to block automated queries or like massive attacks. Like the typical attack about trying to um, reverse engineer and classifier uh, by using a lot of queries and then transferring uh, some adversary examples later on, it would fail by design against such a system because the query part would be blocked early on. Now, this is not to say that this system is omnipotent. In fact, I think that all of us see spam on Facebook. But still, this complexity must be accounted for by real attackers. And it is, again, rarely considered in research papers. To validate this claim, we looked into all papers that had been published in the top four cybersecurity conferences in the last three years, I mean, from 2019 to 2021. We identified 88 papers that were related to adversarial machine learning, and uh, we found out that over 70 of these, they either never replicated a machine learning pipeline or they attacked a toy machine learning model. With these results, it's not all that surprising that practitioners care little about the findings that we provide. However, it is not just our fault in a sense, because if we want to make a machine learning system, we would have to at least know how they are used by practitioners and such information is private and confidential and definitely not accessible to researchers. And if we want to experiment on a real machine learning system, uh, well, we would have to have one machine learning system that is available for research purposes and for security assessments. Good luck finding one. The second observation we make is that cybersecurity is rooted in economics. There is a strong relationship between the two from both the attacker and the defender perspective. I think we all know here that there is no such a thing as a foolproof system. Given enough resources, any attacker can bypass a defense and at the same time trying to block any possible attack is uh, an impossible objective. So attackers, what they try to do is try to minimize the cost they have to make to be successful. And at the same time, defenders, what they try to do is prioritize the threats that are more uh, problematic for their system. And we observed, um, or something that is kind of recurring in our research is that uh, from a resource utilization perspective, um, a common measurement metric is queries. The idea, for example, is uh, that my attack requires few queries than this other attack, so my attack is cheaper, so it's more uh, efficient. Hmm. We reached out to the organizers of uh, a popular machine learning evasion competition, MLSEC. Uh, in 2021, they did uh, something about evading a phishing website detector. And we asked them about the data of the first four place teams, those that achieved a perfect evasion. They had to query the detector and then submit some adversarially manipulated web pages that, uh, that evaded their classification. What did we find? First of the four winner teams, um, there is no account of them using gradients. Uh, if we look at what they did, two of them actually publish their strategy, it's publicly available, and they never mention techniques that are typically found in uh, adversarial machine learning papers. And uh, the other important finding that we notice is that the team which arrived first, um, they required three, 300 queries, okay, but they were the last to submit their solution. Whereas the team that was the first to submit their solution required double the queries, but required also one third of the absolute time. This component, the human factor time in general, is rarely accounted for in research. We analyzed again the 88 papers that I mentioned earlier, and we found that, yes, around 50 papers out of 88, they do perform some measurement of their cost of their attacks or defense, but this is all, all, only in terms of computation, meaning a defense 
uh, does not reduce the baseline performance or the attack requires less query than something else. But the human factor is rarely accounted for. And in reality, it's important. Real attackers, they do take this into account. Maybe, yeah, the attack requires less queries, but if it takes me years to come up with a way to require uh, less queries to implement something that works with less queries, well, perhaps I will not do so if I'm a real attacker. Now, having said all this, we state four positions that try to bridge the gap between uh, research and practice because this was our goal all along. All along. First is, this is mostly for researchers, we should expand our threat models to cover machine learning systems, um, meaning that the generic uh, notation of goal, goal, knowledge, capabilities, and strategy, they should not just look at the machine learning model because the attacker does not want to evade the machine learning model. The attacker wants to evade the system. So they should be extended to cover the much broader system, which is what we have, they have to face in reality. And another thing which I was not able to um, discuss here due to lack of time is that the terminology used to describe these threat models, it should be used in a much more consistent way. Uh, if th for those of you that want to come to, to see the poster, I provide some examples there. Some examples there, there are furthermore in the paper, but the terminology is, uh, it's actually good that I'm not mentioning it here. Second thing is, cost-based threat modeling. Um, researchers, they should account for the cost of implementing either an attack or defense, and perhaps they should, should try to incorporate the human factor into it a bit more. This means, for example, that assuming by default attackers that have perfect knowledge of a machine learning system can be a bit unrealistic, especially because I think that even the developers of the machine learning system do not know how, to, how it works from, like uh, uh, in every small detail. First and second, because it's not free to acquire such a knowledge. So, in a sense, assuming an attacker that has perfect knowledge but has like limited capabilities is almost like a contradiction. How did they acquire how such knowledge, but they cannot do anything in reality? And conversely, there is a lot of value also in from a realistic perspective. We're not talking about research. I'm talking about from a practical perspective. There is value in defenses that may work against limited knowledge attackers because these are more common in reality. The third position, this is for practitioners and in uh, industry. If there are some people here, please listen to this because we would like them to be a bit more um, easier to approach by researchers. Because if the situation is the way it is, as I already said, this is because it is very difficult for researchers to gain access to the knowledge and things required to do some meaningful experiments. And the fourth position is, which is motivated by the fact that only 50% of the papers we analyzed uh, release their source code, has to deal with releasing source code and our committee should do so by embracing a just culture. We have to accept that papers, they get uh, reviewed very fast and uh, sometimes not all mistakes, especially at a low level, they get spotted during the peer review. But by releasing the code, we can see if there are some mistakes afterwards, perhaps systematize some mistakes. I think some people here know what I'm talking about. And uh, we would all benefit from this, and uh, both the people who originally wrote the paper and the future community. By the way, all our resources, they are publicly available. Uh, we created a website, and in the last page of our paper, we created, we put a pretty big table, and among these columns, there is a link to the repositories of every paper that we considered in our analysis. So if you want to look at what is this source code, you can see, look at this table and uh, use that as a point. To wrap it all up, um, do real attackers compute gradients? We don't know, or at least we cannot answer this question with our limited study. Uh, you would have to ask every attacker uh, in the world and ask them if they do compute gradients for their attacks and have all of them answer honestly and tell you no to answer this question. But uh, the point is we cannot prove it yet. And uh, perhaps something that could be done in this regard is forensic of adversarial examples. There is some work uh, that has been started. Uh, um, there's uh, like a peer last year. So perhaps some of you here might decide to do uh, this in the future. Now to finish, I would like to show the team that contributed to this paper, because as I said at the beginning, it was not just all uh, us five authors. All the people that attended the research seminar on security of machine learning last year at Daxul took part in this because all our considerations and positions and whatsoever, they derived from discussion that we had there. So I truly want to uh, say thanks to all of them that 
participators. Some of them are here, and I want to thank them again, also on behalf of the other authors. Thank you. <laughs>